If you have your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45 in your Bibles, if you have them this morning, as we continue on in the life of Joseph. Joseph, a man who believed God, a man who showed strong faith in God. We're often in life faced with difficult circumstances or difficult situations. Sometimes they're the result of a, our own decisions. Basically, sometimes we make a mess of things. Because we make a mess of things, we suffer the consequences. Or, if I can, we pay the stupid tax. You ever paid the stupid tax before? You ever grab something that's hot? Oh, this will be fine, stupid tax. I've done that. Oh, you know what? I won't get dirty. I'll just do this in my suit. The stupid tax. I've done it here at the church before, where I'm like, you know what, there's a little spot of paint, and I grew up painting a lot, so I, I don't mind painting. In fact, I kind of like painting. Some of you are like, I hate painting, Pastor. I kind of enjoy painting. My wife wants to change the color in the house. I don't care. You know, I just can paint it again. In fact, every time you paint a room, it gets this much smaller, so it gets quicker every time. But there have been times here, I'm like, the little spot in the wall, you know what, just give me that paint. I'll grab that brush, and I'll just real quick hit that in that, in that expensive suit. Stupid tax. I've done it. You've done it. I can make it. I can squeeze my car in there. No, you can't. No, you can't. This will fit. I can force it. <laughs> no, you can't. Stupid tax. There are times that we're in those spots because of our decisions, but Joseph wasn't in this spot because of poor decisions on his part. Joseph was there because his family, his brothers, had mistreated him. We've looked at that throughout the past weeks. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 45 today. I've entitled the message, An Unbelievable Response. A supernatural response. We are often faced with difficult situations and difficulties and circumstances, but our response, our responses reflect our view of God. You see, when these difficult times come, our responses reflect what we view. These circumstances don't create our response. Our response reflects our view of God. Or we can say it like this. C.S. Lewis said, Surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence for what sort of man he is. Then C.S. Lewis broke it down in language we can understand. He said, if there are rats in the cellar, you're most likely to see them when you go in very suddenly. If there's rats in our life, you're most likely to see them when something happens suddenly. You see, by opening the cellar door, you do not create the rats, you merely reveal the rats if they're there. And in our life, if our responses do not please God, they are not there because the door is, shown, is thrown open. That open door merely reveals what's here. I want to talk this morning about an unbelievable response. A lady once came to the great evangelist, Billy Sunday. She began to excuse her reactions and partly her anger. She told this evangelist to Billy Sunday, she said, You know what? It's not a big deal. I just blow up and then it's all over. Not much happens. And Evangelist Billy Sunday wisely said, and that is just like a shotgun, it goes off. But the damage that it leaves behind is devastating. Our responses, if you would look in Genesis chapter 45, beginning in verse number 1, where the Bible says, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Lord, I thank you for this day and for these brief moments that we have. Lord, I ask that you help me to speak clearly. But Lord, I ask that beyond me your word would be there with power from your Holy Spirit. Lord, we need your help this morning. I don't know all the circumstances that people are going through, Lord, but you do. And Lord, I know that your grace is sufficient, your strength is made perfect in our weakness. 
Lord, would you show us ways that our responses have been revealed to not please you? And Lord, may we, because of our faith in you, respond in faith. Lord, help this time. Bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Joseph, up until this point, had had a number of things happen in his life. We've looked at them week in and week out, and, and how Joseph didn't come from a functional family. He came from a dysfunctional family. Joseph would say it this way, his life was filled with adversity. Every single step of the way, it seemed that there was adversity for Joseph. It seems as if this guy could not catch a break. There is turmoil and trials because of unequal love from his brothers and his father. Sold into slavery, gotten rid of, never to be bothered again. I can't even imagine, and I have four brothers, I can't even imagine being so upset with a brother that you'd want to get rid of them forever. Get rid of them part of the time? For sure. A couple days? No doubt. Week? Month? Yeah, quite possibly. But forever? But Joseph's brothers were right there and they, they brought great turmoil and trials in his life because of their reaction. This was not Joseph, I wore your clothes. It was not just Joseph, I stole the biggest piece of pie. It was Joseph, we don't ever want to see you again. Life was filled with adversity. And sometimes our lives are filled, it seems, with adversity. Beyond that, when Joseph, as you know, gets to Egypt, he, doesn't, he can't even catch a break there because before long, as he begins to rise, he's falsely accused. And there's more adversity. Joseph doesn't seem to be able to catch a break. There's adversity day in and day out. Joseph is number 11 out of 12 boys. Now, this will be important at the end of the story, but it's worth mentioning now. Number 11 out of 12 boys. Now, I am number two out of seven children. The only one older than me is an older sister. So I am the firstborn male child in the family, carrying on the Howell name. Every family that I know of, at least, and especially in our family, has a hierarchy. There's my older sister. Her name is Jana. There's myself. And then there's Aaron. All right, and then there's Adam and Alicia, Joseph, and then my youngest brother, his name is Anthony. Some of you know Anthony. Anthony, no matter how old he is, is still the baby of the family. I imagine until the day he dies, he will still be the baby. There have been a few occasions uh, where we have all been together for my grandfather's funeral a year, maybe two years ago now. We were, uh, almost all of us were together, minus my older sister. It's interesting, though, that even in that time we're together with my brothers and my, my one sister, uh, we kind of fell in the hierarchy. What are we going to do? And, and Anthony, who is well accomplished, works for a computer programming company in Detroit uh, as his own place and pays his own bills, he has a suggestion, but we don't want to hear it from the baby of the family. In fact, Anthony, you don't speak until spoken to. <laughs> a hierarchy. You know, it just, it's interesting how families kind of work that way. And I kind of wonder, as we get into it a little bit later on, how Joseph's family worked. In fact, you see it when they got rid of Joseph. They're kind of all vying. The older ones had a little, it seemed a little more influence than the younger ones. Joseph was number 11 out of 12. Only one he was older than was Benjamin, his real brother. And everything that went wrong in Joseph's life seemed to stem from his family and his brothers. In fact, if we were just reading this story at a glance, we could blame him better. We could say, the only reason I'm here is because of my brothers. You could, you could understand, not approve, but you could understand if Joseph became angry at his brothers. It wasn't like it would be without cause or reason, correct? You could under, I'm not saying you approve it, but you could understand it. Joseph had tremendous adversity. But then Joseph had some advancement. We looked at this last week where he now is in Egypt, second in command. In that culture, there wasn't an election. There wasn't a special election. Pharaoh said, Joseph, you're number two. The only one you answer to is to me. And Joseph is now number two in the entire country. Egypt during that time was the superpower of the world. That means that Joseph had a whole 
heap of influence and authority and power. Do you see the setup where I'm going with this? He has lots of adversity, and now he has had some advancement. Advanced to a place where he can do whatever he wants to do, and the only person who can tell him no is Pharaoh. He's on the fast track to a management position. He's in the land of Egypt. Everyone knows Joseph. He's traveled the entire country. He has seen the crops. There's an advancement. We won't take the time to look at it, but the previous three chapters, two and three chapters, a little group of people run out of food in a land a little ways away. Happened to be Joseph's brothers. They come to Egypt and they want some food. Egypt is, is the only place apparently in the world at this time that has food. They come to get this food and Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Joseph's been off their radar for 13 years now. 13 years, I haven't thought about this guy much. And uh, they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And through a series of tests and, and things, he, he asks them certain questions, leading questions. Do you have a father? Oh, yes, is he alive? They think this, this austere Egyptian ruler is merely finding it out of their spies. Unbeknownst to them, Joseph's finding out about his family. Joseph inquires about the youngest brother who has not come yet, Benjamin, his real brother, the others being half-brothers. And eventually, he sends him back, and Benjamin comes back. We come to this part, in this portion of Scripture. And there was... Adversity and there was an advancement, but there's now an accounting. There's now an accounting. You see, for all the adversity that Joseph went through, for all the, the lies that his brothers told, one day, one day, it all comes back around. Now let me just pause right there real quick because the Bible teaches us that this is what happens. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that is around. You can't get away from it. It is a Bible truth. You, you can say, well, it'll be 45. Look there, if you would, please. And his brethren, I am Joseph. Now, if I just imagine our current culture, there are things they call that are mic drop statements. Where if you're on a microphone, you make a statement, you drop the mic because nothing else can be said. Imagine you are the brother of Joseph. You are Reuben or Simeon or Judah at this moment. And Joseph, this ruler, this powerful, this powerful man, the man who could lock you in a prison, who could take your life without any regard and answer to no one but Pharaoh, says, by the way, I am your brother that you sold. Drop the mic. He goes on to say this, though, Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. I love the Bible because of the understatements. They were troubled at his presence. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to say it. Okay, boys, we've got a problem. Boys, uh, last time we knew we saw Joseph, we were waving goodbye to him, having gotten rid of him forever. And my, how the tables have turned. There was an accounting because their lies come crashing down. Their deceit, their duplicity is discovered, and their craftiness has been undone. You see, they had gone back and told their father, Oh, is this Joseph's coat? Their father had so he must have been slain by wild beasts. In that passage I mentioned a few weeks back, one of the just challenging phrases, and they could not console him to see their hypocrisy at that time. They had gotten rid of their brother, they lied to their father, and then they tried to comfort their dad. It'll be okay, you bunch of hypocritical liars. But it all came crashing back, and I see the accounting, but I see the alarm. They were silent, 
and scared. They were troubled and they could not say anything. Joseph has all the means, he has all the authority, and he has all the reasons to take action. They were one word away from death. As the second most powerful ruler, Joseph didn't have to say anything, I imagine. He could have, and they'd be gone. Something like this, oh, these boys sold me years ago. Men, make them pay. All the means, all the authority, and all the reasons to have a reaction that we could understand. Not approve of, but understand. We could even identify with. Because maybe, just maybe in your life or in my life, someone has done you wrong before. Someone has lied about you before. Someone has mistreated you before. Someone has done terrible things to you before. Not because of your decisions, but because they were just a nasty person. Been through that before? I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen terrible things that have happened. I've also seen terrible reactions, haven't you? Terrible reactions. I'm waiting. I'll get them back. I'm biding my time, but you just wait because one day I'm going to get you back. Living in that bitterness and that anger. Sometimes people turn it toward the Lord. Lord, you allowed this circumstance to come, this sickness to come, and Lord, you were not fair. God, oh, I'm just not happy with you. You see, I see the alarm in the brothers. And then we come to this part of the story. You see, there's an opportunity for bitterness and revenge and spite. Yet Joseph makes some amazing statements. Look in verse 5 as we look now at these three keys. Where Joseph says in verse 5, Now therefore... I wonder if Joseph paused. I may have paused if I were Joseph. Make him sweat just a little bit more. Now, therefore, what's he going to say next? Off with their heads? Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. Wow. Now, I was studying this passage, and at first that little phrase intrigued me. Be not angry with yourselves. And you could take it to mean that they're sitting there like, oh, man, what an idiot. Oh, man, we blew it. Maybe. But it also could mean this, and I think this holds clear to the story. Angry with yourselves is to be angry among yourselves. It makes a little more sense if when they say, I am Joseph, if instantly they're saying, oh, that's right, that's right. Joseph, I always was your favorite brother. Judah, he did this. Simeon, he did this. Gad, Asher, it was them, Naphtali. Look at them, don't look at me. I told you it was a dumb idea. I mean, how would you react? Would you be kicking yourself or kicking your brother forward? Everything we've seen about these men is they're kicking their brothers forward. Be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. That she sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the, in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in them and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt." This reaction of Joseph is amazing. I want to give you three quick truths about how Joseph was able to respond the right way. In the face of great adversity, in the accounting, in all this, Joseph didn't respond with bitterness. He didn't respond with hurt. Joseph didn't respond in anger or spite because of these three truths that we see in verses 5 through 7. I'll make them real easy for you. Three truths to grasp this morning. Number one, Joseph did this. Joseph acknowledged the hand of God. 
Look at this verse again. He acknowledged the hand of God. In verse number five, Thou therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. Here it is. For God did send me. He acknowledged the hand of God. We see it in verse number seven again. And God sent me. Do you see it? He acknowledged the hand of God. What Joseph say, is saying is this. I don't blame you. I acknowledge what God was doing. I could blame you. People would understand if I were to blame you, but I can't blame you because it wasn't you. God's hand was at work in this situation. And the reason I'm not angry with you boys, the reason I'm not upset with you boys, the reason I'm not screaming and calling for my guards and throwing you to jail and a dungeon and killing you is because it wasn't you. It was God that had a hand in my life. And if you and I are going to respond the correct way in adversity, in trials, and difficult situations... We must learn to acknowledge the hand of God. To say, God, you're doing something. Now remember, for 13 years, Joseph did not know what that was. 13 long years. 13 hard years. There are many times in our life it seems that God is nowhere to be found. There are times when we look for God, but we cannot quickly see him. He cannot quickly be located. And it seems as if God is letting things happen that, that, we, that he wouldn't allow if he loved us and if he, he was still there. But there is a term for God's working in invisible ways. We call it God's providence. And God is always working. He's always at work. He said, you meant this for evil. God meant it for good. God did send me. Someone wrote this poem. It goes, my father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul I'm glad I know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But still I'll trust my Lord to lead for he doth know the way. Though night be dark and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in him, he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see, my eyesight is far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift and plain it all he'll make. Though through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. And if we're going to respond the right way, we have to acknowledge the hand of God. But he noticed something else here. Not only to acknowledge the hand of God, he accepted the plan of God. It's one thing to acknowledge the hand of God. God, you were in this. God, you were at work. It's an entirely different thing to actually accept it. To say, God, thank you for your plan. God, thank you for what you did here. Now, not just acknowledge it, but to accept it the plan of God. If you want to respond the right, the right way in difficulty, if I want to respond the right way in difficulty, I must learn to accept the plan of God. Sometimes we want a plan that just goes uphill the whole way, and that's uphill of our promotion and our advancement. But God's way tends to go through twists and turns, does it not? Sometimes His way involves pit stops. Sometimes his way involves potholes. And see, down south, they don't understand potholes. In Michigan, we understand potholes. You, some places can lose a car. But God's potholes are always carefully undergirded by his strength. Not only must I acknowledge the hand of God, I must accept the plan of God. If you look in those verses, Joseph says it like this, God did send me hither to preserve life. He said, I accept it because he was doing something bigger than I ever realized. I accept the plan of God. You know, sometimes trouble will come, but you can learn to accept the plan of God. And Joseph here accepted the plan of God there's the illustration often told about an old bookmark. Now, books are those things that come with a binding and paper in them. I have a Kindle. It's hard to use a bookmark in a Kindle. 
But in those old bookmarks, they would, maybe you've seen these before, they'd often maybe embroider the front of them, a nice picture. Sometimes at churches, ladies would embroider them for the churches, and you'd see on the front, Jesus saves, or a nice cross. A beautiful bookmark you could put in your Bible or in a book. If you were to look at the back of that bookmark and turn it over, it's always a mess of threads, is it not? Looking at the back, it never makes sense until you turn it over. And then you see what God was doing, accepting the plan of God. There's one more thing I noticed, though, in, this ver in these verses. In verse number 8. Not only did Joseph acknowledge the hand of God, accept the plan of God, but he appreciated the blessing of God. Look in verse number 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and a lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. You see, you see, brothers, you see, boys, I don't blame you because God sent me here. I acknowledge his hand. I accept his plan. But let me tell you what he did. I appreciate what he did. Now I'm a, a father to Pharaoh. What that means in that particular culture is that in that culture that he was the closest confidant to Pharaoh. No one had Pharaoh's ear more than Joseph did. No one would Pharaoh listen to more than he did to Joseph. He said, listen, you were doing this, but this is how God blessed me. I am now right next to Pharaoh. I am a father to Pharaoh. I am a lord, it says, to all his house or in relation to the people they all admired in the country, Joseph, and that he had made me a ruler throughout all the land or in relation to the kingdom. Or what he's saying is, boys, I might have been 11 out of 12. I might have, in this hierarchy of the family, not had a place at the table, a place to talk. But God got involved, and this is what he did. He preserved life. He made me a father to Pharaoh, a lord to Egypt, and, and a ruler in the kingdom. And you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Appreciate the blessing of God. Now, we can look at Joseph, and I want to pause here for just a moment and say, wow, second in command of Egypt. That'd be amazing. But would you trade 13 years with your family to go be in charge in another country? Would you trade that? I don't know that I would. I happen to love my wife and kids, my mom and dad, my brothers and sisters. I, I don't really care about ruling in another country, to be honest with you. It, it, not on my radar. I don't think Joseph grew up thinking, boy, one day I might be in Egypt. One day I hope to be a ruler. Now he had a dream, but, but would you trade all that for this? Of course, on this side, wow, Joseph, you got a lot of money now. Got a lot of power, Joseph. Would you trade all that time in prison, falsely accused, serving day in and day out for this? But see, Joseph didn't complain about the circumstances. He didn't complain about the blessings. He appreciated the blessings of God. You know what, my friend? Sometimes we're quick to complain. We're quick to complain. This past week, my hot water heater went out of my house. That's a real third world problem. Right? To have a hot water here to go out of the house. Oh, the travesty. A cold shower. Except I didn't have to take a cold shower because in my house there are two hot water heaters. The other one had already gone out three months or four months ago, right? So that one's already replaced. So I could sit there and say, wow. Look at this. i got to replace a hot water heater. And because of the way they built it, I have to buy a more expensive hot water heater, not a cheaper hot water heater. And wouldn't you know it, they're having a, some good sale. I had a good friend who helped me, and I got a tremendous deal on one. Now, I'll be honest with you. All right, we got, I got it swapped out yesterday. It works just fine. My wife now has hot water again. She says amen. <laughs> you know what? It's a hot water heater. But how quick are we to complain about a little thing like a hot water heater? Oh, Lord, really? Hot water heater? That's got to go out on me? That's got to break on me? Lord, I'm serving you. 
Lord, I'm trying to, to do what's right. And we are quick to complain rather than quick to thank. But I got to see this past week three different ways that God works specifically inside a hot water heater situation. I wrote them down in my journal. Lord, three blessings you brought me because of this hot water heater. God is good all the time. We have to learn to appreciate the blessings of God. And it may not be just what we were looking for at first. All right, Joseph didn't, wasn't born and saying, hey, listen, I, I want to be the ruler. But God's way is the best way. And he appreciated the blessings of God. For 12 years, I was able to be the principal at Bridgeport Baptist Academy. What a blessing. Really, truly loved it. But i got to be honest and frank with you. I never thought my whole life about being a principal. No one does. Little K-5 graduation, these kids come up here at our school and they talk about things they want to do. I'm going to be a police officer. Oh, that's great, yeah. I'm going to serve in the military. I'm going to be a missionary. That's great, that's great. No one says, I'm going to be a principal. If a K-5 person said that, we'd slap them. Say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> right? You're going to have to have something else in life. You're in for a whole world of hurt. And, and to be honest, when Pastor Lett had first asked me, I was praying about it, I was a little bit like, do I want to be principal? I mean, they're old and stodgy and stuffy and, and terrible people in life, aren't they? Right? That's, I, mean, I mean, I had principals growing up, right? But I tell you, one of the greatest blessings of my life is being principal of the school. Now, maybe not for the students and the parents and the, and the teachers, but for me, I, I loved it. It's almost, it's almost like God knew a little bit more than I did. Almost like God had a little bigger plan than I did. And Joseph says, listen, boys, the reason I'm not angry is I can acknowledge the hand of God. I can, uh, I can accept the plan of God. And I appreciate the blessings of God. We're all going to face difficult situations. You will, I will. How we respond, how we react, reflects our view of God. I see Joseph. I see his reaction. And I don't doubt in my mind that Joseph believed God. Because you only react this way if you believe God. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you for your servant Joseph. Lord, I'm humbled and challenged by his reaction, his response. Lord, a strong faith in you brought a compassionate response to his brothers. Lord, help us, because we will all face difficulty. Lord, I don't know difficulties that everyone is going through here. Lord, I know that you want us to respond in faith to you. One who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you were speaking, God spoke to me. I need to respond the right way. I need to, to change a reaction. As you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up, slip it back down? Amen. Some folks are always already coming to pray. If that's you and you want to come pray, you can come pray right now. You don't have to wait. I wonder if someone would say this morning, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't even know that I have much faith in God at all. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Just slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll call no more attention to you than did anyone else. Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray for those folks who indicated by an upraised hand that they'd respond the right way in difficulty. Lord, may we respond based on our faith. Lord, if it's been revealed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that our response has not been right, May we come back and turn back to you. In Jesus' name, as we stand to our feet, folks are praying. You come pray now if you need to. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. If you're online today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we would love to talk to you about that and open a Bible over the phone. We have folks by the phones right now. If you're to 
call and say, listen, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. God loved us and Jesus died for us. And by believing in Jesus Christ and his blood that he shed on the cross, in payment for our sins, by trusting in Jesus, we can have a home in heaven forever. The Bible calls that the gospel, the good news. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Folks are praying, you obey God now. for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your strength to give to us. Lord, as we walk this path and this life, Lord, I'm so thankful we're not alone. May we lean on and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.